And we're live. Another edition of the Johnny and Gene Show. I'm Felix Levine to my right, John A. Light, and to my far right, Gene Borello. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. I mean, uh, since since I've last seen you guys, uh, Fear City came out, so that's big. Um, so we're going to get into some of that. And then Gene also has a lot of fascinating stories about sports betting in the mob and all different kinds of, uh, you know, things around that subject. So I guess first off the bat, just since it's... Uh, recent news and recent recently came out i think on july 22nd um and was doing so well i mean top 10 kind of everywhere i know it was number one in the u.s at some point um fear city i mean how was first i think what was the experience of like of it you know filming it um and then you know is did you feel like they did a good job of really uh showing the the truths or of what happened uh during that time period labor unions i mean there's so much to get into yeah, I think, uh, I, I forget on what interview, somebody asked me about the editor of the show. I believe his name is Parsons. He also did, uh, he edited another show called Once Upon a Time in London uh, with a friend of mine that actually did that uh, movie and starred in that movie. So I think a big part of it is uh, the team that worked on Fear City from the production level to the uh, directors and the, the guys that ran the show itself, they did a great job. Because what they did was uh, to pick it, the mafia, uh, from the past to the present. But uh, the storyline was the obviously the uh, implementation, the implement of the law, the RICO law, which uh, Giuliani brought, which destroyed and decimated the mob. And uh, it goes into what you're talking about uh, as far as discussing the unions and the, the racketeering stuff that we were involved with, whether it was the seaport, whether it was uh, Teamsters unions, uh, the meat industry, and uh, cement. So, you know, it showed how we controlled every industry, which also controlled the banking. And, you know, basically you're running the city through all these unions and the banking and um, Wall Street. And they did a really good job showing that. When did you first hear about the RICO law? I mean, was that something that you guys, you know, in the mafia even knew about? Or when it was really Giuliani that brought it up? Yeah, it was Giuliani brought it in. And uh, it was a law that was really made for white-collar criminals. And uh, they switched it around and used it uh, against the mafia, which we all learned what it meant uh, pretty quickly. I was joking about how we all got educated pretty fast because we knew it was, you know, the uh, the beginning of the end by this law coming about. And then Gene... Qu yeah, no, I was going to say, Giuliani got the RICO idea from the Joe Bonanno book. Joe Bonanno wrote a book, and basically that's where Giuliani got all his ideas from to create this, this RICO act against the mob. Mm. So actually he's the, he's the one that actually um, gave Giuliani the idea in his book. How different was RICO implemented in like your time period? Do you know? Oh, we knew about it already. I mean, we already had seen a hundred cases of it. That didn't scare you? No, I mean, not really. You know, we know it's like this. When RICO, it depends what kind of RICO charge you have. You know, what I mean, there's all different kinds in it. You know, obviously with RICO violence, you know, you have RICO gambling, you get five years, three years. When you start having violent charges in that, twenty years, thirty years, you know, they have minimum mandatories of these made-up guidelines, you know what I mean? So, RICO is very dangerous. By the time it came into our, you know, our generation, we already had, uh, the whole neighborhood was in jail. Yeah. So everybody knew what RICO was, you know? Do you think if there was no RICO law, the mob would still be functioning just as it used to? Oh, 100%, because now when they bring a case, they can take down a whole organization. You can bring 100 guys in on one case, you know, before... Uh, these conspiracy laws were completely different. It was hard to bring down groups of guys. You could bring down individuals, it'll take you forever, and even individuals, it was hard for that to stick. Uh, but now they have this, this law, which is uh, kind of difficult to, to teach somebody who doesn't understand it in the public. But basically, it uh, shows the organization is in, in a group of more than two people. And uh, when they when they implemented that, they're able to knock down 15 or 20 guys. So especially in these construction industries and, you know, in the uh, commission case, where you're able to decimate everybody at the same time. So, I mean, it was really something that uh, Giuliani brought that uh, people in the, in, the, in the street world, not just the mafia, but gangsters that don't understand it yet. Or, you know, what's going on now in the street, if they bring it in as an organization, uh, 
causing these problems on the street, they're going to understand what it is when they start getting hit with time. And it's no more two and three years, uh -huh. but you're looking at 20 years and up. And that changes the game. At what point did you guys know back then that this RICO law was, you know, going to really start to, to affect you guys? I mean, was there a point that you realized, oh, shit, this RICO thing, what Giuliani's talking about, we're all kind of going to go down? Well, I mean, well, if, I would give you a little a little thing. You could be a conspiracy on something. Like, I had conspiracy to selling guns. I never touched or sold a gun. This is a new thing they brought in now. So you could just be a part of the case. You have nothing to even do with it. But I'm being charged with selling guns. I never even sold a gun just because you're a part of the indictment. Mm. So you're wearing everything on the indictment now. So basically, if he has Rico murder um, and I'm a, part, I'm a part of that case, now it's, it's all in one. So Rico, it's basically for the people behind the, the curtains that they can't get calling the shots. That's mm. what Rico is created for, for the guys calling the shots. Well, I'm ordering you to kill somebody, but they can't get that guy because he's not at the scene of the crime. But they have to have proof. Uh, I mean, there's not. I've seen guys go away with not much proof. Put it that way. Uh, I mean, I guess it's for also for the top guys. I mean, when you know, in the Fear City, when you know, they they kind of show that visual of, I guess, the hierarchy of the mob. Um, it's really just to ultimately get the the bosses. Right, that are calling the shots. Right. Because well, because you're insulated. And Rico, what it does is it stops the ability to be insulated. Hmm. So uh, by implementing this law, you're uh, bringing in charges of, although I'm doing the actual shooting, uh, the guys that ordered those hits uh, are also part of that Rico racketeering to, in, to uh, further the organization. That's really what, the, what, what, what they're charging, saying that our business furthers an organization as a group. Hmm. And that's the way they... Uh, lock us all up was there a common hatred back then for giuliani when he started <laughs> doing this stuff or really started um, bringing it my uncle andy wanted to kill him yeah. my uncle andy is i'm sure he had a million no, hits no. On him, no 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 my uncle andy's really trying to get permission to kill him yeah yeah that's a true story he wanted to kill him wow yeah and you got i mean do you do you know of any other kind of details of different people who are trying to put hits on that you can talk about yeah, I mean, listen, Giuliani knew it himself. He was going to shooting range. He was, you know, he started carrying. Different guys were being taught how to use a gun. And uh, I got to tell you, he was a fearless guy. So the name of uh, the series Fear City was a, a good chosen name on a lot, of re a lot of fronts because a lot of these guys like Giuliani didn't have the fear. He walked around, especially in the days where we were killing a lot of guys. So it's not like you know the modern days, but back in, in our day, yeah. uh, there was bodies everywhere. So when a guy like Andy wanted to kill Giuliani, he was serious. He didn't just talk about, I want to kill Giuliani. He meant, I want to kill Giuliani, I'm gonna kill Giuliani, <laughs> you know, yeah. so. And also I think, well, I think one of my favorite parts of the documentary, I think at one point um, you talk about how almost your praise for Giuliani, you know, how you, like, you think what he did is impressive, really, on a, on a front. If Giuliani was in the room today, what would you say to him? Uh, I joke first off because he made a comment about maybe he could have been a gangster at one time. Uh, the other thing is... Do you think he listen, could have? Oh, yeah, listen, he's a highly intelligent guy. So uh, guys, when they're that intelligent... I've seen worse you know, involved. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just recently spoke about a guy, uh, Cookie Dorso, who was uh, shot in the head. Uh, his cousin was killed by his own family, uh, the Genovese crew, uh, is a guy that could have been a boss, a uh, tough guy with his hands, uh, no joke guy, intelligent, he had a crew of guys that were around with them, friends of his that I was just with just recently. These guys were my, my enemies for a lot of years. Uh, I got a lot of respect for him because people ask you know that all the time about you know why do you respect your enemies like this because they were serious guys they were guys that understood the life they were guys that got shot in the head and survived mm -hmm. a cousin that died I mean we really seen a lot of action all of us guys and uh, it was over for us and we walk away but Cookie's no guy to, to, to fuck with so if somebody th makes a mistake and think well I can make a move on this guy he's very capable still has a ton of friends uh, I joined as one of his friends now and uh, you got guys like him, and we're going to bring Marco on, who's Fat Joe, the uh, rapper's uh, friend when they were kids, and a serious guy. He was a veteran. Uh, he's been in jails, been shot. His mother died in a hit. So uh, these are guys that he's going to come on. He's a friend of mine. And, and guys like these guys, uh, I respect uh, Snow Billy. 
uh, who obviously also got shot in the head and the neck, and he lived. And these are action guys. And this guy right here is his uncle and family are uh, very good friends of mine. And he died this weekend on Thursday, right? Uh, nine bullets into his car, young kid, 21 years old, Albanian. I'm sick over it. I respect the family. Uh, my condolences to them, to the uncle. And, you know, when I talk about all these guys and all these killings and all these shootings, these are real lives. And this is what we need to talk about with kids. And I have the guys like Marco or Cookie that have true experiences of being shot up, not this nonsense you get from people that don't know anything about their life and they talk ridiculous because this is a real life. And this is why I'm so against the... Uh, defunding of the police because day after day we're losing young kids from the inner cities most of them and uh, kids that grew up like me and it's and it's terrible really so uh, when you get these guys that are real guys and you get guys like again like cookie uh, I, it gives a look on both sides of the fence to uh, people that want to understand the street mob enthusiasts people that think uh, you want to talk about tough guys he's a tough guy why would I talk good about my enemy Unless I just got to be honest to people so they understand what we've been through. And uh, his friends, and I've brought up Anthony Tabita before. There's another guy out there, Fabi. These guys are tough guys. These guys were legitimate uh, street guys, uh, gangsters, whatever. And they changed their lives. And, you know, these are guys that I highly respect and I want people to listen. Why I speak so highly of certain people. And they seen the action and lived through it. Yeah. Oh. And I think also, I mean, you know, even in knowing you and even seeing you now, seeing you choked up over, you know, you, you truly have changed your life around um, to talk about kids. And I know you because, you know, you'll call me on the phone and we'll, we'll have these conversations off air. It's not just for the camera. You know, it's it's truly something that I know you're passionate about now since Gene just got out. Right. He's passionate about. Um, so, you know, I guess just a reminder for listeners and people out there that this show is really about that is also well, to uh, i wanted to say also you understand something the gang violence is still real yeah the mafia might be watered down and it might not be going on with them right. you know they haven't shot nobody in probably you know who knows how long but i'm saying for the gang violence the bloods the crips the bathias the minigans they're very it's still dangerous i mean they're still killing and shooting every day so it it's really they're still out there but it's crazy because we don't even there's not that much attention on it, you know? There never is. Yeah. There never is. Well, that's the idea why I keep bringing in different guys from different ethnic groups, whether they're Greek, whether they're uh, MS-13, whether they're Latin kings like Chuck. Uh, you know, some of the gangs, are, you know, we got a couple of guys that have come on from motorcycle gangs. And I want to show that it's, I'm just talking about the street. It's not necessary. We just happen to be involved in the mafia. But I want to talk about other things besides me and Gene and the Mafia. I want to talk about real guys that been shot, that survived it, or had family members that were killed, like his cousin. And, you know, this is uh, really the reality, not the... See, it just it infuriates me when you get adults especially talking nonsense when they should be teaching these kids. But they don't know the reality of it because they didn't live it like us. So, you know, I know what it is uh, to be stabbed up and shot. And so do these guys I just mentioned. How do you think, uh, you know, I think it's something that's never talked about in schools, and especially I think in communities where kids are especially at risk of getting into gang life. How do you think these kind of topics should be brought up and taught to kids? Because I think, you know, you go to a perhaps a, an at-risk community where a lot of kids are going to go towards gang life, it's probably good to have a program taught about what, you know, do you think, how, how, what is the best way to teach people about not getting into gang life or mob life or anything, you know, crime related? Well, I like art. I like music, mm -hmm. right? I'm not particularly good at either one of them. And, you know, I understand that it's, <laughs> it's a subject in school. Yeah. But they should also have, and I've been talking about this, having classes when the kids are young in school so they can identify and understand at a young age how to stay away from the pitfalls of things that all these guys I just mentioned and myself and Gene, we didn't stay away from. So if it's like anything else, yeah. if you exercise young, you continue exercise as you get older. And the same thing, exercise these kids' brains to stay off the street. Let them keep hearing the negative 
things about the street. Teach them at a young age. There is no good ending when you're on the street. And uh, hopefully that, you know, some of these shows that we're, uh, you know, talking about in Fear City, and they show that. And also I want to say I had a lot of interaction with the uh, young gang members in jail and Rikers Island especially. And if you talk to a lot of them, they really have no other choice. And I'm not mm -hmm. using that as an excuse. Like people say, oh, well, you have a choice. What about when you wake up, you have no food. You, your mom and dad are, 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 are possibly on drugs or dead or gone. You have nobody looking out for you. And now they wake up and they tell me i got to survive you know what are they doing they can't get a job and a lot of these they go to these gangs they think like it's a family or they look out for each other oh uh, you know sell drugs to me on the block do this shoot this one shoot that one so they that's all they know you know what i mean so they get caught up in it and they think that's what it is to make a few dollars to almost to survive because mm -hmm. they have nothing so what do you do then like i said they're, they're they're in a bad spot a lot of these kids that come out of these uh bad areas they really don't have a choice sometimes. And a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it's really the truth. Look, wait. I want them to see this, right? If this is up, they can see this. This is a real kid, a nice kid. He's gone. His parents are gonna suffer forever. Never gonna have a right life again. And that's the part that, and being Albanian and being friends with my, you know, his uncle for, since forever, 30 years, that's the part that they're not seeing. You know, they just seeing what they want to see or hear and just what he said. The reality is this, they're dying left and right. So again, and let's not get political, but defunding police isn't the answer because this is the answer, body after body after body. Last week I talked to you also about another friend of mine who lost his son. A seven-year-old just uh, uh, just got killed what about Chicago? last week. Chicago was 100, I think, 60 Chicago, shootings last week. Insane. So the, the thing is, if we really care about these kids, if people aren't happy with the police, some people aren't, some are, whatever, let's talk about uh, training them better then. But I says, and, and with everybody who has parents out there that are concerned or elderly that are scared to walk the street, uh, they got to understand that these kids keep dying. Uh, and, you know, people in wealthy neighborhoods aren't dying. So I think that, you know, let's, this conversation has got to be opened up again. How do we protect the young kids? And just what you said, some educational classes at young ages should be implemented in every school system from elementary school on the way up. And then the same thing with the uh, police force. They should be visiting these schools on a constant basis. There should be development of community uh like in Ocean County, Mitch Little is the chief of police. He has so many programs. He interacts with the, with the kids in the area and the adults. I mean, he really is running something that was really impressed when I was down there doing talks for, at one of his academies at the college. And I think every every city, every state should have this, and it should be better communication. And the only way you're going to do that is implementing uh, some of these programs and also not defunding police, but... Uh, fund them and uh, train them a little better if, they, if they, you think there's an issue. Do you think that if you had had programs and maybe been educated about some of these things when you were young, and same for you, Gene, do you think it would have maybe swayed you out of um, living a life of crime? A hundred percent. For me, because yeah. as I got older, I had some good people that were behind me, you know, pushing me in the right direction. As an older guy, that helped me you know, change my life. And then I, you know, paid it forward. And I talked to kids all over in schools and juvenile centers and parents. And now he's doing the same thing. So, yeah. yeah. For me, I was a knucklehead. So, you know, I mean, when I was growing up, I probably, like now understanding it now, I look back, I was just, you know. I was probably gonna go into the wrong way regardless. Hmm. You know, even Why do you think help. that is? I don't know, it was just the way I was, I don't know. I just, I went the wrong way. And there's gonna be certain kids that are gonna be like that regardless, you know what I mean? You could try to help them as much as you can, but they don't wanna hear it. You know, I was one of them, so. What do you think is the, you know, for you, the best piece of advice you could have heard that would have maybe done the most to, to well, sway you away? <laughs> well, the outcome. I mean, yeah. look at this. I mean, I didn't. I thought what I was getting into. I thought it was like this great thing where everyone looks out for each other. We're best friends. It's the total opposite. Mm. It's all about who could get a, over on who. When you're gone, take his stuff. Screw him. Let's kill this one. Let's rob this one. That's all it was, you know. And I became that person. And you, you never, you never. Did you ever understand some of the repercussions or ever really? No, I didn't care about them at the time, you know. Yeah, you thought you were above, you were just above oh, it all. Yeah, you start thinking, you know, who you are. And you start thinking, you know, you, you get ahead of yourself. And it's the only time you start, you know, maybe coming down from that high when you're in jail? 
Oh yeah, and also when you realize when you, when you, when you see everybody turn their backs on you and you start seeing the people that you love and care about like wow you're the only one here yeah two out of all these hundreds of people i used to go out with all and party and hang out with all my friends and now there's only like two people here yeah that's when you start seeing what's going on you know nobody cares that's the true saying and how do you i mean i guess for the both of you how do you rewire your brain at you know at an older age young young old <laughs> but you know once you're yeah. a little bit older than when you're when you're a young teenager or whatever to rewire your brain to you know not be all about that violence all all the time well also i think when you get older you get more melt you calm down more you know what i mean really? when i was a teen yeah i really do because when i was in my 20s i was just out of control i think when you get a little older you start calming down in general you know what i mean mm -hmm. i think i think that's what it is what do you think is yeah, it i mean you know age is experience so you're gonna you know see and then like i say i could sit it off like yesterday i was back in my old neighborhood because of this uh and i don't even want to say his name to disrespect this family uh I just want to show respect and uh, hope the community, especially Albanians, understand what what I'm saying. But I was in my neighborhood yesterday in New York and sat in Woodhaven, Jamaica Avenue, with guys I grew up with. And we went through a list of, of guys that died, were killed, OD'd, uh, killed people, doing life sentences. And I mean, I'm not talking about one, two, five, ten names. You know, when we do these shows, I just rattle off probably about ten names just now of guys that have been shot and survived or died. And, you know, it's terrible to, to, to have that existence like that. So I think as you're getting older, you, you know, I keep saying the same thing. We owe it to guys your age. He owes it because he lived it and he's a little in between our ages. And uh, there's a responsibility to hope that you teach these kids the right way so they don't end up what we've been through you know right. yeah it's it's true but also you know i didn't want to um i want i want to also explain something real quick because when you have guys from the old generation like for instance in my old family right you have guys that are coming home now that are from the old generation this is not a good thing because they still think it's the 70s and the 80s mm. so now they're running the family when they come home which is happening right now i have we have guys that just came home that they're serious guys that are now took over my old family the battle family but they're going to come home and say what the fuck is this <laughs> this is a joke they're going to be still thinking about killing people doing all this stuff from back in the day so this is actually bad for the younger guys coming up now because these guys might say all right well you got to go do this work you know go do this and they're because they're still stuck in the old generation now the new generation where i'm from they don't throw bricks and blackouts. They're not doing. They're not doing no violence. They're doing sports betting and loans. So it actually could be dangerous right now with the old timers coming home. Mm. Once that for the kids that are coming up, not realizing it's not going to be. Oh, go punch him, go slap him, go go kill him. Now you're putting the kid's life in danger. Now now you're getting sending somebody up to go away for prison for the rest of their lives, because these guys that are coming home from the old school era, his era, or a little above, believe in in murder. They don't believe in punching you. They believe in killing you. So that, that's another thing I want to explain to these kids. Don't get caught up in this stuff right now with this mafia stuff or any stuff because when these old timers are coming out now, which they are, they believe in a whole different ball game. Mm. You know what I mean? Do you think that, I mean, you know, the mafia was here at one point, then it kind of dipped to now. Do you yeah. think there's going to be a resurgence? Not a resurgence. It's like this. When you get old timers, like I said, they believe in what they believe in. Mm. They don't care. It's embedded in them. You know, that they told my boss at the sentencing, this is embedded in your blood. You'll never change. You know what I mean? That's what they told them. It's embedded in you. It's in your DNA. So when they come out, that's all they know is mafia, 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 and they're still going to live by these ridiculous rules that are so stupid. Do you think it's true that it's in your DNA? I mean, it's. Just, it could be. I mean, I don't, I don't know. know. I just to be bad. I mean, maybe, but I know you. The, when you're when you're when you're accustomed to watching violence as little kids, it's just normal. It's not. It's in your DNA. I don't think per se, but this is normal development for us. You know, mm. most kids are in a normal household, but when we're from the inner cities, that's why you always hear me talking. Uh, speaking up so much for inner city kids, whether they're Indian, whether they're black, whether they're Spanish. Wh I don't care about color. Everybody knows that already. I've said it a hundred times. I just care about the inner city kids. We're accustomed to watching violence since we're young. Dysfunctional households, whatever we have. But as you get older, you start to understand the world a little more. You mellow a little bit more experience. Uh, you become friendly and respect you learn even though you might not agree with somebody and they're your enemy you respect them for what they are and, and the ability they have whether it's good or bad and then as you're older you you become 
friends with guys you never thought you'd be friends with, like I just said. And I just spoke very highly of a guy that tried to kill me a lot, that a group of guys that tried to kill me were serious killers. And guys have been shot up themselves and survived and their family members killed. So this is not just, you know, and the part is anybody that's out there that has that hate in them for the message, uh, they better recheck themselves and rethink. You know, this ain't about me. It's not about Cookie. It's not about Tabita. It's not about Fabi. It's not about Gene. It's not about, and I could go run in those names. It's about respecting life and teaching these kids not to live what we live through because we know what are suffering with it. Mm. We lost our friends. We lost our family. We lost, uh, you know, enemies. We dealt through killing enemies, and, and you got to you got to live with that. So uh, hopefully these shows and some of the things we say opens up the eyes of some parents, and they know how to deal with their kids that are running amok in the street, or unfortunately like this boy that just lost his life, and uh, good-looking kid. You know, he had a whole future. Nice kid, tough kid for sure. And that fast, uh, a wild guy from the street took his life. And, and you know, and for that guy, he's going to lose his life too. Okay. And I'm not saying anybody's going to kill him, but one way or another, he's going to lose his life. He's going to lose it to jail, or somebody else will kill him, or a new incident's going to happen and he's going to get killed. Because it just doesn't last like that. No one wins. Nobody wins. No. And that's the point. He's not winning, they're not winning, and unfortunately for the families, they suffer. Right, and we we were in the middle of that for a lot of years. So today's like a somber day for me because of this kid. So, yeah. And will you? I mean, you know, I think the other thing that you talked about earlier as well that that I think is interesting, and we don't. I guess the people who were never around that crime life and people, you know, dying right and left. I guess for the both of you, talk about that conversation. You know, I mean, you've done it a lot of times with the families after. Because no one, there's no video camera there. There's no, we don't see these conversations. No one talks about it. No one writes about it. But, you know, that feeling, I think, is something that's probably really important for people to understand as well of, you know, that conversation with the family, how devastated they are. Because, you know, for a while they're going to grieve and they're going to be behind at home. And, but, you know, I guess in your experiences, what, what is that feeling like when you're with a family of someone who just lost someone you have, to, you to crime? You, want, you know how horrible it is to see a mother laying over her son in a casket? It's probably the worst thing you could see in the world. Yeah. You know, it, there's nothing worse than that. It, it, it's, it's horrifying because when you're living that street life, you're like, oh, I got bodies, I got this, I got... You're not realizing it's, it's, it's horrible, man. You know, you don't, you don't learn until you actually go through it. Yeah. And at that point, I mean, you know, even in your past was seeing that something that uh you know made you dislike the life was it those moments that made maybe at times made you feel like i don't know this is not for me or i i need to get out or i mean you know uh, i'm gonna be honest with you and I, it's horrible to say i was looking to kill somebody whenever i could like if i had the chance so i was i was waiting for the order and it's sad to say because when you're living that lifestyle i was trying to get bodies under my my belt Right. That's the reputation I wanted, and it's that's sad. the mindset. That's the mindset. It's a brainwashing of sorts. right. It was that was the whole thing. I was waiting for an order to get somebody. You know, I couldn't wait to kill someone, and that's the saddest thing to say. And and everyone's like, everyone kept telling me, "Oh, you got you got another one in you. You're gonna live in jail your whole life." Everybody kept telling me that. You know, I so when you get when you realize how dumb it is, and you see people going through the pain and agony. My my enemy, who I tried to kill multiple times, he's dead now, and you know somebody else killed him. You know what I mean, and uh, it's it's just never ending. You know what I mean? It's it, it's a horrible thing. You know, you only live once. Yeah. Do you feel the same way, John? Uh, I just think that uh, at the time you're not analyzing yourself as far as uh, who you're gonna kill or what you're gonna kill. I don't even think I thought about it. If it happened, it happened. If that day I had to do something like that, then I did. But it's after when you step back, you start saying to yourself, "Well, I gotta." live with this i gotta accept this i went to family members who i killed somebody in their family and i was involved in killing other people in their family i sat with them so when people say you can't even imagine the pain that is for everybody right and you know last yesterday when i'm sitting with this family and my friend that friends for forever and you know there's no words there's nothing i could say to him you know, I called him this morning. There's no, what can I say to him? 
Uh, nothing I say possibly is going to make the mother feel better, the, the father feel better. And I'm purposely not saying the name even though I'm showing the article because his brother right now is in Albania. And uh, they're from Mont Montenegro. And I don't know if he still knows about it. And there's other family members that actually don't know about it yet. So I can't even imagine the suffering hasn't ended for, the, uh, end for them at all. And it just started just started when he lost his life and there was nothing I could say. I'm sitting there with the father, the mother, the uncle, um, with the kids and what are you going to say? What can you possibly say to make them feel even a little bit better? There's nothing possible and there's nothing they're going to feel better for probably forever uh, and maybe you know one day they'll have a way of you know finding some peace through God and through religion but for now, they lost the baby. He's 21 years old. And when, and when somebody dies, it changes everything. You know, my cousin, my cousin was murdered in a mob hit, and um, his father still won't celebrate Christmas, uh, celebrate no holidays to this day. Twenty something years later, he still won't go to a holiday dinner. Nothing. Why? It just changes him. It's you lost his son. You know, uh -huh. saying you know, I could go on. It, it just it changes you. It takes a part out of you. You know, it's horrible. You know. And you know, I mean. Also for you, I mean, kind of John talked about being befriending your enemies as well. That was something I was going to ask it you. It happened to me a few times, you know. Um, it happens. I mean, you're in the street life. I mean, it's weird, you know, obviously. You know, like I said, it's a very <laughs> awkward situation. But, you know, you get over it, you know, especially. I was just chaos, man. So, I don't know, you know, I didn't really care. You know, it happens a lot. But do you really trust them at the yeah, end that's of the day? Yeah, that's You don't. You don't. It's more of a, it's more of like a. A fear, a fear thing like he don't know what you're gonna do to him. We just want to avoid the situation, so we're just gonna. All right, we're cool now. You know, nobody wants to deal with this crap no more. You know what I mean? So that's what it was for us, at least. Do you feel like that? Can you ever trust fully your enemy? You know what's funny though? What you just asked me. You can't fully trust your friend. <laughs> yeah, really. That, that's the mob world. There's guys that I'll, I'll talk about, and one of them we're gonna have on the show. Uh, he was a boss of the patriotic family. You know Bobby, and uh, he had a wild life. You know, and later on, he became a pastor. In the mob world, your best friend uh, sets you up to kill you or kills you. So those are everyday stories. Uh, Marty Bossart, which you know, was a kid that grew up around me, and I warned him, "Don't trust your friends." And a couple of days later, they set him up and uh, and was killed. His best friends so, killed him. Yeah. yeah. So this is the life of the people that don't understand because you you stay with me you work with me we go eat you imagine if you lived the life i used to live every time you walk out and you think you're my friend i take you somewhere and i can kill you this is what they're not understanding there's no way to live like that that's a terrible way to live and that's the message to these kids it's just not worth it. at the end of the day whatever you think you're going to get out of this life is not worth your life and you're i mean you're removed now but how do you do you feel like now even with regular people non-mob people you can have fully trusting relationships i mean for the both of you i mean with a guy like you of course yeah i know yeah. you're not, <laughs> you're not a violent you know right. you're a regular guy um of course a regular citizen yeah an ex street guy or street guys that ain't how we are like uh you know we we changed you still really don't know where they're at mm. you know what i mean fully you know what i mean you feel that you feel the same way yeah, I mean, listen, I'm the same guy, so I think the same way. Mm. You know, people always say the same thing. Are you capable of, of killing again? And I'll, I always have the same answer. Uh, hopefully today I don't, and I don't <laughs> know about tomorrow. I can't lie to anybody. You know, it's like taking a drink for an alcoholic. Yeah, of course. You know, you know if, if somebody came in the room looking to hurt one of my family members or you or somebody while we're sitting here, of course, I'm, I've done this my whole life. You know, you're not a different person. You just learn to react different. And you learn to change your judgment of how you do something. But, you know, you still are who you are. And every day it's a work in progress. I don't lie to kids because I want them to know it's going to get difficult at times. Uh, you're going to want to react physically and you just don't do it because mm -hmm. you, you, you respect your life more. And that's the difference. You know? Is there one go-to, like, maybe thought or thing that you can do when you feel maybe like a quote-unquote flare-up or something? Just, I guess, for people listening, if they're ever in a situation where they feel that old self coming in, you know, of a, maybe like a deep breath or I don't know what it could be, um, if there's a kind of a go-to that you guys have had so that you don't channel that former well, self. Well, here's the thing with me. You got to understand something. When you're living that street life, you wake up. And when I used to wake up, all I thought about was crime, who I'm hurting, what I'm doing. 
uh, what do I got to do today? Where do I got to collect the money? That's our life. It's not like it's make-believe. Make that's what I did. I woke up and I worked for the mafia and that's all I did was crime all day. So to change over now when I wake up nowadays, it's, you know, it's a whole new ball game. <laughs> I mean, I'm waking up. Sit on the couch. There's really not much to it's do. My, you know, it, you're definitely less stressed out. Definitely <laughs> less stressed out. You know, I'm always looking. You know, don't know who's who. I got to get today. Who I'm sitting on. You know, because my department was collecting money, and a lot of times with collecting money comes deadbeats and guys you got to chase around and beat up and assault whatever you have to do. So now it's less stressful. You know, um, now when I do get mad, um, I just think about. Not go, I don't want to go back to jail. That's the biggest thing. That's what always keeps me. Like he said, I'm not. I'm still the same person. If someone comes to hurt me, I'm going to defend myself, obviously. But I'm not going to go look for it like I used to because I looked for it. That's good. Yeah, and, that's and it's, I think that's truth. that's also a really important factor is that you're now able to make that switch. Like you understand right. that switch as opposed I, of to me before. Well, you need positive role models. Oh, I yeah. mean, Dave Gentile is a guy that was a friend of mine since the late '90s. Who, uh, when I feel like uh, I'm having a bad day or I think I'm thinking the wrong ways, I pick up the phone, I talk mm -hmm. to him. He's like a brother to me. And uh, he helped me through a lot of this over the years. And he was law enforcement. So he's what are those a guy. Conversations like? Well, he's like a brother to me, so I just talk openly to him. You know, I don't say. I just call him up and tell him, you know, I like to crack this guy over the head with a bat today if I'm mad at somebody. And I just say it like that. And, you know, we talk, and that's it. It's the walkthrough. And then I do, you know, with therapy, and I did it with him yeah. when he comes home because it's got to be somebody you could talk to and, and just release it a little bit and then let it go. You know, and you're not looking to go backwards in life. You're going, looking to go forward. So mm -hmm. uh, you got to just be a realist and say that, you know, people get angry every day. Every average person. An average person who's not a gangster might get into a fight. And he's got to think, I can't fight anybody. I got children at home. I got a responsibility. I got a good life. Why would I throw it away for this bum that's trying to fight with me? Probably has nothing. Or he has nothing to lose. Or maybe he is a nice guy and he just had a bad day. Because there's guys that I met that were my enemies became my friends. And there was guys that I met that were my good friends and became my enemies. So it just depends on what life brings you, right? And you got to be open-minded to that. And if, you know, for, I guess, maybe for, and I think, you know, a lot of people are, are lucky that they have someone to look up to. Um, but if in the event that you don't have that role model or that person that go to, um, you know, what's maybe your best piece of advice for those people on how to, you know, I mean, and it's great that we have shows like this so that you can talk about it so that they, maybe they can listen and this will be their outlet for them. The mosque, synagogue, church, religions, uh, faith leader, whatever you choose, whatever your belief is, therapy, exercise, positive. These are all positive things. Mm -hmm. Reading, the Bible, anything that helps you walk through or people like ourselves that have been through it, reach out. You know we talk to hundreds of people weekly, monthly, uh, parents that call. So it's just positive people putting you in the right direction. Not the guy that's going to tell you, yeah, you're right, here, here's the gun, go shoot him. Right. I mean, those are people you want to push away from your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to prove something and then go on a gang to prove it. Yeah. You can prove it to yourself by looking right. in the mirror and saying, I'm going to do something right today. Working out for me does cools me down, too. Really? I love working out, so that does cool me down. When I'm, Because I get hot quick. My, I'm a hothead, so I get mad fast. Mm -hmm. I'll, within that 60 seconds, anything could happen to somebody. If I'm, when I cool down, I'll start, you know, I relax, I calm down. Now I'm old, I, I handle things differently. I'll put, go in the bathroom. Maybe I'll talk to myself if I have <laughs> a couple of <laughs> relaxed jeans. And that's what I'll do, you know, try to calm myself down. And working out will really relieves my uh, stress. And, I mean, now you've been home, what, it's been six, seven months? Eight, uh, almost eight months now. Almost eight months, wow. And have you felt that kind of uh, progression in your own, I guess, like, psychological development of being able to just kind of calm down and, and, and finding those different outlets and ways to, to kind of... Well, my mom and my family joke because they never knew me to go 90 days without an incident. So yeah. they're just like, wow, this is so long. Even in jail, like, I never went more than 90 days without a fight, an incident, or some kind of beef because I fought with everybody. Even in the street, I beefed with everybody. So it's like, my mom's so in shock that I have not been in an altercation yet. But She's in a like, way, you know, it's not, it sounds almost stupid, but I think I think I can speak for, for myself and John as well. It's like, we're almost, we're, we're, one, we're happy for you, right? you know? And two, it's, it's nice to see, you know, because... It also shows your development and your, 
you're cha- you're actually changing your life Man. around, and that's a beautiful thing on well, so many levels. That's why we're here, you know. We don't get none of that. We're just trying to help the kids and show people what bullcrap their their life is, you know. It's, and I'm sure your mom can sleep a little bit better at night. Oh now. yeah, she <laughs> she always used to get the phone calls, you know. My God. Yeah. What 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 is that conversation like? You know now. I mean, even you know, separate question. How is your relationship with you know family and your mom changed from back when you were well, crazy and now? Well, like I said, they they laugh about it because it's like they said it's two different people. Yeah. You know, because um, I wasn't even allowed in her house back in the day. You know, wow. her husband only let me in the house. Cause you're just that crazy. Yeah, she he didn't want me in the house. You know, I'm walking around with a hundred thousand dollar car, ten thousand in my pocket, no job. The guy's like, "How do you even have this stuff? What are you doing?" Like he's he's a cop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like God want him in the house. Get him out. You know what I mean? And for you, I mean, what's what's that feeling like for you to know that you now have, yeah, I guess, a better relationship with family, mom? Oh, it's everyone. cool. I get along, and, and now it's like um, I get along with you know people a lot better because I had nothing to talk to with them. What do I have in common with them? Right. Oh, what's up? What'd you do today? Oh, I shot somebody. Like, you know, what are you gonna talk about? Oh, I robbed this guy. You know, it's like we, there was nothing in common to talk to with a regular mm-hmm. person. Now I have, you know. I could sit down with my family and have regular conversations, you know, about regular things, not just mafia crap, you know, all that stuff, you know. Is it also hard, though, because, I mean, even if it was things that you couldn't relate about, it's still, I mean, your guys' days were crazy. I mean, event-filled, adrenaline rushes, you know, how do you, does it, are there ways in which you can find that excitement other ways now, you know, even if it doesn't mean, you know, shooting people or doing, you know, bad things, let's put it that way. I mean, yeah, I guess I, I, I try to I try to keep my day busy all, all day, you know, I really do. I try. I love watching sports, you know, I work out, I just keep I just keep my day occupied. You have to because if I sit around I still have to think. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That's what I don't want to do. Yeah, that's interesting. You know what I mean?